So there's still people coming in. We're just going to wait another minute or so. Mm -hmm. But hello to everyone who's here. Hello. Yeah. Marco gives me the, the thumbs up. So I'm yeah, yeah, just going to start today's um, seminar. I'm very happy to, to have Sandra Vitalic with, with us today. And um, she will tell us about her project on photography. She is a photographer. I'm going to um, say some more words about her in a minute. And um, she is introducing her a very, I think, very important work on photography related to war and memory of violent human experiences and their, um, let's say, lexicality or lack of maybe in, in landscape. We're going to talk about that and in, in photography um, altogether. So Sandra, um, has participated in a lot of projects and authored a number of very interesting um, books on photography, much of the work being related to the violent past of the region. And one of, of these books is, um, I'm going to show it to you, I hope you can see it, is this one, In Fertile Ground, Neplod Natla, which she will um, tell us about in, in a minute. And it's a very, um, a very impressive work, I, I have to say, and it's here with me in, in the um, office. So whoever is is nearby or, or here on, in Rijeka can, of course, come and have a look. And um, yeah, Dr. Vitalic has graduated and written a doctoral thesis in Prague at the Academy of Performing Arts, Film and TV. She also worked as a professor for photography in Zagreb at the Academy of Performing Art. And um, now she lives and works in, in Stockholm in Sweden. And her work on photography goes, as I said, far beyond the wonderful books she will be talking about today. So, for example, and also because I have it here with me in the office, um, her book Polygama is something I highly recommend. Also, very interesting um, book on, on war photography and, um, you know, really considering all the, the, the many aspects and nuances to, to um, analyze and, and think of when studying world photography. While also, I would say, because of its focus on Croatia and Bosnia, um, it gives a great insight into, into experiences and the history of war photography in the, in the region altogether. So, um, yeah, I, I'm not going to say much more. It's, a pleasure to have you here, Sandra, and I'm really looking forward to your your um, presentation. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Rosvita, for uh, your kind words and for presenting uh, my work and also for inviting me to be part of this seminar. I am very pleased to be here today. I am I'm coming from a different field, from, from arts, so it's a bit uh, a different perspective, but I will try to uh, present to you how I developed uh, this project, you know, because when you see the book or the exhibition, uh, then you see the final work, but uh, I think it's always interesting uh, to see how the project developed and, you know, what was behind how I came to certain ideas or, you know, how I worked with it. So I hope it's going to be interesting and, of course, just feel free to ask uh, any questions regarding this. And also this, this work is... Um, uh, related to the region uh, and to history of the region. So sometimes maybe it's going to be a bit difficult to understand for, for those with foreign background, uh, all you know, the nuances of the events. But uh, you know, uh, while I was uh, while I will talking, I will be talking then with the pictures, there is always a text. So you can read a little bit about the events that are uh, connected to uh every location so i hope that will clarify uh, a little bit but if i uh, fail to be clear enough just feel free to ask of course so i can explain a little bit more uh if needed and um if uh, we can start maybe then i will just share my uh, screen mm. Uh, let me uh, try again because I wanted to have it like a full presentation. Oh. 
for some reason I cannot uh, share when I open the presentation, like slideshow. Um, I don't know why, because I, it seemed. I think before. you can start the slideshow after. I think mm -hmm. once you share, then you can okay, start the maybe. slideshow. Okay, yes. maybe. Maybe that's it, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and now go on the slide. Yes, thank Perfect. you for help. <laughs> So the title of the project is uh, Infertile Grounds, and uh, I started it, I believe, in 2009. Uh, but the idea, the idea itself was uh, very old, actually. I, I, uh, I started thinking about uh, this change that happened uh, in the historical narrative, uh, because, of course, I'm old enough to remember um, how it was to live under socialism and how it was to live in, in Yugoslavia. And so I, even if I was a child, I remember, you know, the narratives, the historical narratives that were present uh, at that time. Um, and then, you know, with the fall of socialism, I suddenly uh, became aware of the change of this narrative. And, and suddenly something that I thought is like a historical fact, it, it proved to be just an interpretation. Uh, so, so, you know, I was 18 at the time. So for me, it was a surprise, I mean, um, to discover something like that. And, you know, some of the narratives that were hidden uh, during the socialist time emerged. For example, uh, the stories about uh, crimes uh, connected to, uh, I mean, that uh, committed by partisans after the Second World War. Uh, the narrative during socialism was uh, uh, always just a heroic and positive story about uh, the resistance and the uh, fight against uh, fascism. So, so that was that came as a surprise to me, and uh, and and you know uh, also during the uh, war years, lots of places that were important in this national history. Uh, became part of the inflammatory speeches, political speeches that were also uh, fueling uh, this conflict to become a war. For example, I'm thinking about Yasenovac and, and Bleiburg, like two oppositions. I will talk a little bit more about uh, those specific examples. Uh, you know, so I was, I was interested uh, to communicate in a way what I was observing. Uh, um, this change of uh, perception of certain locations and also you know some of the national holidays suddenly changed uh, the time and uh, i mean the date and the location uh, where this where they were celebrated for example serb uh, it's a very small town uh, in uh, in croatia that was well known for uh, um, it was celebrated as the place of the uh, uprise against uh, fascism. And it was celebrated as the day of the uprise in Croatia. Uh, but then in the 90s, the, the, the date changed, the context of the location and the event totally changed. Um, so the place became insignificant, the, the monument was destroyed. Uh, as many of the monuments in uh, socialist uh, monuments in in uh, Croatia were damaged or destroyed, so so that also reflected, I mean, this change that that happened in in the society. Um, and of course, it was not very easy to you know to wrap my mind around it. You know, how do you work with this idea? I mean, uh, so I was not sure you know where to start. That's why the idea was much older than the actual work. Uh, and and I, I started thinking about the landscape and uh, what what does it mean? What is the landscape to us? And and two references were important to me in this case. And that the first one was a book by Simon Sharma, Landscape and Memory, and this quote: "Before it can ever be a repose for the senses, landscape is the work of the mind. Its scenery is built up as much from strata of memory as from layers of, of rock." And also Liz Wells, she, she's a historian and theorist in, in field of photography. And she sees uh, and describes landscape as a social construct. Uh, and uh, that def defines 
Uh, she defines it as the look that comprehends both nature and the impa impact that humanity has had upon it. So that was for me interesting that uh, I don't look at the landscape as a nature, but as, uh, as both, you know, something that is there, but also uh, the, the context that uh, we have from looking at this space. And, and um, for, you know, people from the region, when you mention uh, certain you know, names of the lo lo locations, uh, they immediately include all the uh, knowledge they had from, from these places. For example, when you say Yasenovats, you cannot say this, this name without having all the layers of context with it. So, uh, so you know, I started thinking, okay, now I want to visit those places and just uh, experience them. Uh, and it was quite common during the, the Yugoslavia that, uh, you know, pupils were taken uh, to visit Yasenovac to, you know, learn about the events and pay respect. And, uh, and unfortunately, I was not one of the students who went there. So I was never in any of those locations before I started working on the project. So for me, it was very, very interesting to actually go to each place. And... Uh, this this was like probably one of the first, our first photographs that I made on, on this on this topic, and it it, it started quite you know prosaic. Uh, this is the, the place in Zagreb. I lived at the time in Zagreb, and uh, uh, that's the place where I usually walked with my dogs. So uh, and I had no idea what what is this location. I don't didn't know anything about the history of this location. It's uh, the Otoschina, and although there were some monuments. Uh, at the time, uh, you could not read anything about the events that uh, that happened there. So I pretty much was very ignorant about you know what's there. I was just walking the dogs because it was one of the you know places you you could you know go freely walk. And uh, and then I was interested in this monument because uh, um, I was you know there almost every day. So. Uh, I saw, you know, this monument when it was uh, full and that at a certain point uh, it was destroyed. So half of it was destroyed. So it was removed for, uh, for reconstruction. And then uh, I was just, you know, passing there every day. So I was thinking a lot about this change of perception and how this, this monument suddenly lost it, its meaning and, you know, having this like empty wall uh, suddenly was uh, like it could represent well what I was thinking about and also you know at, 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 the, uh, at the day when they usually uh, pay respect to the events and uh, to the vic victims who were uh, killed there uh, they brought the flowers I mean even if the, uh, the monument was empty of its content I mean the flowers still were brought there so it was interesting so that was one of the first uh, photographs that I, that I made on this project and I kept it in the series, although you will see, I mean, in the, all the other photographs, usually there is no monument. I avoided actually monuments because they're, they're mostly connect, connected to this politically motivated uh, culture of memory that can change its context. So I was more interested in experience, experiences, uh, experiencing uh, the location without it, you know, although the monuments were there, of course, in certain places, uh, I didn't want them in, in the photograph. So this one is kind of symbolic. So that's why I kept it. Um, this is one of the, this is the location actually where uh, I decided on the name of the project in Fertile Grounds. Uh, for me, the, the name has uh, this meaning, uh, how we cannot move on. Um, before we resolve certain things from the from the past, so that's that's my idea about the title. But also this field, for example, uh, why why is it in fertile grounds? Because this this field was uh, a location where allegedly uh, lots of it's actually a mass grave. I mean, um, and. Um, you know, the, the villagers who live um, in the in a village nearby would, you know, occasionally find uh, dig up bones 
while working on their fields. I mean, they're using these fields for like agriculture. So that was ca- kind of horrifying to me to, to you know, to, to think about the, the, uh, the, the, you know, corn or whatever is grown in these fields that were actually fed by the, you know, like human flesh and bones. Um, so, so, you know, that was, I, that's how I was inspired actually to this title in Fertile Grounds, both uh, physically and uh, symbolically. And um, I was interested in, in uh, perception of the, you know, like everyone, like a common person, not a scientist or a historian on this, on this topic. So I pretty much uh, did my research looking at the media, you know, how media wrote about certain events or uh, certain places. And for example, uh, of course, this is in creation and it's quite small. Uh, so you, you probably won't be able to read, but it's just uh, some, an example of the text that were present in the media uh, on this topic. And, uh, you know, and then I had to find those locations. It was not, I mean, of course, when you have very, very well known locations like Yesenovic, you know everything about it, but then uh, certain locations that were totally unknown until then, um, I had to find them. And uh, so I was looking in the, in the media, you know, which, which events are suddenly talked about or uh, which locations are mentioned. So I was, I, then I went there like this. And, um, and I was surprised that to discover, because the media usually wrote a lot about how the research is done that was uh, obstructed before. Suddenly, like Croatia was trying to uh, uh, um, re- do research on former uh, victims um, that, you know, the victims that were not talked about, the victims of partisans. But when I got there, actually, I, I, I saw that no research is done, actually. They probably just, you know, um, did a little bit of the research. But uh, as far as I know, in creation, not very thorough research was done on this. I mean, we, we even had a not a ministry, but some some like state uh, organization that was taking care of this. But I, I'm I'm not sure they were well funded. I mean, uh, so it was more uh, to you know talk about these events or the research, but not actually doing anything. And it's so much easier to to speculate on the numbers and to speculate on the events before you make an ex- actual uh, research. So it's uh, always very convenient to use. Uh, before elections, so you can observe in the media that suddenly certain events are discussed in the media or, you know, like again, uh, raising this as a propaganda, in fact, I mean, uh, always uh, discussing, you know, the crimes of communism and, and so, so it was, you know, what I discovered working, working on this, but uh, so one of the places that were super important was Bleiburg, of course, because that's the, a symbolic place of this like suffering of uh, post-war suffering of Croatian uh, Ustashas and, uh, and uh, Domerbans. Um, so of course I went there a couple of times and at the beginning I was seduced because that's the location where uh, lots of people gather uh, in May, when the events happened there, so I was at the beginning seduced by this mess uh, coming there, paying respects. Uh, you know, sometimes um, in Ustasha uniforms, and uh, uh, but then of course I decided I'm not going to use any of it. I still wanted to look at the at the, at the place itself. So uh, so the images that now I have from this location uh, look like this. And uh, just to go back to this image, maybe it's not visible in, in it because it's a bit small here, but uh, it's showing a trench, actually. So I was, uh, it was interesting to me that this, this location is still quite militarized. I don't know why the trench is there. Maybe it was just used uh, for some military uh, training or so, but it's a, a place very close to, to, to the border. So it's still... You know, for me, it was interesting that this was still militarized uh, and not just uh, any wood. Uh, and the, the op- opposite is Yasenovat. So, you know, even in, in Croatian society, you, you could observe the polarization 
you know, you, you could even tell someone's uh, political orientation uh, if, you, if you raise the topics on Bleiburg and Yasenovac. I mean, it's, uh, it becomes quite ob obvious, I mean, your political affiliation when you talk about these places. And uh, Yasenovac was also, you know, quite, here is just a text for, for those who maybe are not aware uh, on events. Uh, connected to Yasenovac, but it's interesting also that Yasenovac was a lot of in the media uh, during the war, uh, because um, Serbia, in order to uh, fuel the fear uh, against Croatia and, and, you know, what's going on in, in Croatia, uh, raised a lot of uh, questions about Yasenovac and, you know, uh, wrote a lot of in the media, Again, testimonies from from that time, just to you know, uh, have this uh, trauma present uh, in order to have like volunteers to 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 this war in the nineties, um, and uh, you know, lots of places, especially like Yasenovac, um, were also uh, quite. Um, I mean, you abused and abused, and uh, the context was uh, changed because, for example, I will uh, just uh, go a bit further, you know, just to explain a little bit how, how this uh, location was used uh, in political speeches or for political purposes. Uh, here you can see in this, uh, I mean, you can read it yourself, I don't have to read everything, but uh, comparing, you know, how Yasenovac was talked about in Serbian media and how it was what was going on in Croatia at the same time. And so you can you can see that in in, in Serbia, uh, the the uh, number of victims was very very large uh, during uh, Yugoslav time. Uh, it has been said that six hundred thousand victims were killed in Yasenovac, and in Serbia, you know, in the nineties, it was talked even about one million people killed and while in, in Croatia, uh, the events uh, in Yasenovac were, uh, you know, it, it was ongoing relativization of the history and, uh, and uh, Yasenovac was called a working and not a concentration camp, a uh, number of deaths were diminished. So it's, uh, it, all, it all fueled actually this debate and uh, how we see this, uh, uh, this location. And uh, just to mention, uh, it's very interesting that the Asenovac concentration camp is a very large complex. And, and when Yugoslavia you know, split, part of it remained in, in Bosnia, actually, in, in Republika Srpska. So, so uh, you know, the, the ongoing uh, debate is still very different. I mean, in, in May, when you have the commemoration in Yasenovac, they talk about... Uh, around 80,000 victims, but in Doña Gradida, when they have a commemoration, you know, almost at the same time, they talk, still talk about 600,000 uh, victims. So it's still, I mean, this, uh, it's still present. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not resolved in a way. And I mean, uh, there is a research done um, in, uh, in Yasenovac, and uh, if you go to their website, you will see their current number of the victims. And I recently I read about uh, some Croatian historians that were uh, actually trying to contest this uh, research and uh, saying that it's not uh, that it's not accurate and, and so so it's an uh, ongoing debate actually still still present. But I can go back now to uh, also to this is Donja Gradina. So this is just across the river and it's across the border and. Uh, it's uh, probably the location that it was uh, uh, maybe the most difficult to picture in a way because uh, it's 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 actually the the area is filled with just mass graves, and when you look at, at the image, I mean it's quite idyllic, right? It's like <laughs> beautiful, you know, like autumn colors, and and so I was not sure that I did the best uh, the best image there, you know, because for at certain locations I came a few times. I was coming back just to uh, just to find the right image because it, it was never easy uh, to define uh, what can represent uh, a location. And uh, uh, 
I, uh, I don't know what was, I mean, my intention was to uh, experience the place and, uh, and uh, transform it in, in an image that can uh, raise some, I don't know, emotions or thoughts in, in audience. And, uh, and it's, I mean, it's quite personal. And sometimes I, I get the feedback that the images are beautiful or maybe too beautiful for the, for the topic. Uh, but uh, in a way, I, th I thought the images should evoke some emotions or, I don't know, I don't work in just uh, this like very forensic documentary uh, way, even if that would be a legitimate, you know, way of treating the subject, but I, I chose another another way of working. And um, I don't know if you were able to read a description on Tony Gradina, but I will want to just, uh, you can see here that I'm mentioning this poplar uh, that is a natural monument. Uh, so this is the, uh, the this poplar that uh, actually fell down and it was preserved as a, as a natural monument and I, I was especially at this location I was wondering how you know because the trees that that are still present there uh, were there when the events happened and I, I started thinking about how this I mean is, is there a, like an invisible inscription in those trees uh, you know about those events and uh, recently here in Sweden I was uh, at uh, Stockholm University to visit the researchers who uh, determine uh, climate change looking at the at the at the tree trunks because they they can you know determine you know the temp average temperatures at the time uh, when you know the hun hundreds years ago in the trees so that was super interesting and I was thinking I didn't ask them because I thought maybe that's not their field of you know um, of expertise, but I was wondering, you know, is there an inscription that, uh, you know, is there uh, something that we can read from the from the, those tree trunks from from that time, you know? But it's just me wondering. It's there is no, you know, scientific evidence of anything like that. But um, one of the locations that I visited is uh, Uvala Slana on uh, Island Park. And this location is, is interesting also because um, it's almost invisible in the, in the collective memory. It was also uh, a place of a concentration camp uh, during the Second World War. And uh, today there is no um, inscription there. There is no memorial, nothing. And uh, it used to be there, but uh, it was destroyed. And when they tried to put another one, it was immediately destroyed the next day. So it was very interesting how even for something like that was happened so long ago and that uh, shouldn't be a question of, you know, like the whole world uh, pretty much agrees on, on the horror of the Second World War and the Holocaust. And uh, but still in this small island, I mean, its inhabitants don't want uh, this memory of the of the events preserved and, you know, the uh, one of the reasons might be, you know, like cons dirty conscience in a way that, you know, maybe some of the, you know, like ancestors participated in, in this, uh, but also like uh, the more prosaic uh, co the, um, reason, and that's tourism, because, I mean, they probably thought, uh, we don't want tourists, you know, sailing in this beautiful bay and then finding out that it was a place of horror, you know, so that's probably... Uh, the reason that it's not, but of course, uh, uh, people who had their family members killed here, or you know, had been there for, for, they need a place to commemorate, to come and pay respects, and you know, visit those places. So it's uh, there should be uh, some you know right to uh, to a memory, to be a part of collective memory. Uh, this is me at the time <laughs> taking pictures and I just wanted to show this image because it shows the camera that I used and this is a large format camera and probably doesn't mean if any of you are not like uh, into photography maybe it doesn't mean to you but the large format camera uh, is uh, it gives a very large uh, film or slide in this case and it's not yes maybe first I had to mention that it was not uh, a series that was photographed digitally 
so I used uh, this very slow process. So it was analog photography and I used large format photography that uh, slows you down. So you, you, you don't just go around clicking like you would do with, uh, you know, like taking snaps with uh, your um, phone or, or a digital camera, but it slows you down because you just use, uh, it's uh, one film at a time. So you, that you have a cassette that you put in the back and usually you have just two, two frames. And so it's very slow process. And, and I, I chose it deliberately because I wanted, you know, it was kind of meditative. You know, you, you come to your place, to, to this place. Usually I was by myself and I had to feel it. I mean, I, I would spend some time there. And as I already said, it's very difficult to decide on the motive, which kind of represents a, represent a place. So that method was uh, for me the right one. And it was complicated because I, at the time I, I was not able even to develop those slides in Croatia. I had to send them to Slovenia or to Austria to develop. So it was all the, everything was very slow and, and quite expensive to work. But also this, this large slide uh, gave me the possibility to print uh, also large images full of details. And that was also important because I wanted this, uh, this image at the end when, when on the gallery wall to be to have like an immersive uh, quality, you know, that as a, as a viewer, you could see it and examine the, the small details and, you know, almost immerse in the, you know, so that this photograph becomes almost a real place for you. And uh, this, this is a, a location that actually, I only had one frame left at the end of the day when I came here and, uh, and, and uh, and this is the you know the the one image that uh, was done. So it's, sometimes it was just one frame that I had to decide <laughs> on what I'm doing, and that's it. And here um, I can explain. This is Ovchara. Um, I can explain uh, or show you a couple of images that I did on this location until and why. Then explain why I chose this to represent the location. Uh, and I, I, I was here a couple of times at this location and I also did, I did some like, uh, uh, I photographed a little bit with my digital camera just to, uh, you know, like make notes because it was very hard for me to deal, uh, to deal with this location. And it's, uh, so, um, I'm showing you now, you know, so this was the final image, but I'm showing you now what I photographed in the process of deciding what is going to represent this location. So this is, uh, uh, you can sh see shadows of the, of the crosses. Uh, this is the monument that is present there. This is some like leftover of the flag in the field just behind the, the monument or something like this, more abstract, more about nature. And, uh, and then I looked at this, you know, I started thinking what, what this place was before it, it became important, you know, what was it? It was just a field. I mean, it was in the middle of nowhere. Uh, there is nothing particular about it. It was not important or interesting in any way, you know, but then suddenly uh, the, the mass crime, uh, you know, happened there. And while I was working on this, on this series, I, uh, I discovered that also the landscape, the, the feature of the, of the landscape is quite important in deciding, you know, where you commit a crime. Because, you know, all those bodies had to be buried somewhere. So usually, you know, the, the locations that were uh, chosen for such a crime, uh, they were chosen because it was, uh, you know, of, of the natural feature. For example, like if, if it was... Uh, uh, like a foiba, what's the word? Like the hole in the ground or, you know, like a natural, uh, you know, lowered ground or, you know, so, so that was, that, you know, was quite interesting to me that, you know, the landscape it's, itself became kind of complicit in, in the crimes, you know, because of how it was, then it was chosen to, to be this. And, and then I looked in, in, this, in this, for example, this road, you know, you have this old uh, dirt road that was just leading to like fields, very insignificant and nothing. And then you had this new paved road that was made 
because of the, what happened there and because you know lots of people come now to visit the place and pay respects so then i decided that this this uh this motive actually um shows you know this change of of this in, insignificant location that it came with with the events so then when i came next time i decided this is that i'm just wanted to to describe how my thinking process behind it was so just to have and for those who don't know what this is uh, a little bit on background of the Uh, this is Adolfovac's uh, location uh, near Zagreb on uh, mountain Sljeme. And uh, if this one is maybe my, one of my favorite or more, most important photographs. I really, uh, I, I am quite attached to, to, this, uh, to this image. And uh, here is the background of the events. Uh, I, you know, part of the series are locations which are important. For example, everybody knows what happened at this at this location. But uh, until recently, I think maybe this year they they did uh, some uh, plaque there, and maybe two years ago they started doing uh, commemorations there. But before, you know, this photograph was from two thousand nine. Uh, not many people were aware, uh, even that this horrible crime happened actually in Sljeme. Because the, in Sljeme, I mean, if you live in Zagreb, you just go for hiking there for family weekends. It's a, it's a location where you have like only pleasant thoughts and memories. And and then you know, even when I discovered, you know, that uh, totally changed the you know uh, how I uh, saw this you know place that I used to go. And, uh, and, and I remember when I had this exhibition uh, uh, in Zagreb for the first time in, at the end of 2009, and actually it was the, uh, the exhibition opening was on 8th of December. And you can see that the family uh, Z was killed on the, the evening of December 7th. So it was, you know, the anniversary. So, so I remember how people actually reacted to this, also to this image and to all the exhibition. And it was quite important for them to, to, be, to become aware how 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 close you know how close to them it is i mean this because when you when you think from this perspective today events like this are almost Im impossible to happen but in 1991 our life was quite similar to how we live today and suddenly almost overnight you know uh, crimes like this uh, became possible so it's just kind of a reminder that that this like mindset and uh, can happen at any time quite quickly. I mean, with fueling propaganda and, you know, like this is uh, just to be aware that it's, uh, that it's possible. I mean, that we uh, very easily uh, become, you know, uh, insensitive, um, hate other people, you know, for no reason, or, you know, you know what I mean. This is also another photograph that was, uh, taken there and uh and of course i decided to include those locations in the series because i wanted to raise a question also who has the right to be remembered who has the right to be part of the official uh, culture of memory because in croatia of course uh, uh, uh politics pretty much determines what is part of the collective memory i mean you have a monument in in Ovčara, but you don't have a monument in Adolfovac or this is Sisak also where uh, uh, citizens of Ser Serbian origin uh, were taken for questioning and were killed. And, uh, and for a long time, Croatian state uh, didn't want to you know, prosecute or find who did, although it was all, I mean, uh, county pre prefect uh, Juru Bradarac was actually one of the uh, people charged with uh, crimes when finally they decided to uh, to prosecute it, and um, so it was quite uh, close to the you know to the government to the uh, to the state. And uh, and when I visited this location, it was uh, you know uh, I found there uh, the uh, therapy writing 
you know, it was now used for a, a place where uh, they kept ho horses for therapy riding, and it had such a, you know, horrible uh, history. I mean, in, in those, the same barracks where uh, people tortured and killed. <clears throat> But as I said, uh, you know, with this immersive quality of the images, I wanted this, this, uh, this photographs to become kind of a memento for also for those victims that, that had no right to be, to be remembered. And uh, I would end here <laughs> and uh, open, you know, time for, for your questions and comments. Great, thank you so much, Sandra, for this very, I mean, very interesting insight into your project. And also, I, I really appreciate your sharing your, your personal history of, of, you know, how you actually get to a project and how you, you get to, to um, pick certain things to be in and, and not in and, and all these, these very interesting um, steps, I think, are very, very important also for, for all of us to, to share. So thank you very much for that. I could imagine there being a lot of questions and I would just open the floor maybe to, to people asking questions if they want to. I don't really see all of you yet, maybe. Yeah, no, thank you. You're welcome to comment also, share your thoughts on anything I said and or showed. Kevin, I see, has a question. Yes. Thank you very much for the, the fascinating talk and the amazing images. Um, you. Just uh, first a, a short comment and then a question. Uh, the, the comment is in related to the, the poplar tree and the kinds of marks that um, these crimes may have left on the natural landscape. Um, I, I'm just, it, it reminded me of, um, the phenomenon with the blue butterflies in Bosnia, where um, in areas where there are mass graves, um, the soil was disturbed and old seeds that had been dormant were brought upwards to the ground and the nutrient composition changed because of the bodies, which led to um, mugwort growing in these mm -hmm. areas where there are mass graves and a specific blue butterfly um, that feeds on mugwort suddenly became very prolific in these areas to the mm -hmm. point where um, they were actually able to use blue butterflies to find mass graves in Bosnia. Oh, wow. Um, Thank you for sharing this. I yeah. didn't know this. It's, uh, yeah. And, um, but the, the question is, um, I was really interested in what you were saying about um, how just mentioning or remembering certain crimes um, could help identify someone politically. Like um, it almost serves as a litmus test for your politics, whether you talk about Yasinovats or Bleiberg, for instance, um, where to the point where um, you can't even be like consistently anti-war crime um, because you no longer have a political place there. If you mention Bleiberg, you're immediately pinned as um, a, a Croatian nationalist or a Ustasha mm -hmm. sympathizer because of the way this site of memory has been um, politically manipulated and uh, used for propaganda purposes. And of course, the, the issue is the same with um, anyone mentioning numbers. Um, I saw this comes up again and again with the numbers in Bleiberg, the numbers in Yasinovats, um, the numbers in Ovchara, um, and also obviously Srebrenica as well. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm curious, was by actually looking at multiple sites, um, uh, such as Bleiberg and Yasinovats and documenting um, the, the sites of memory, um, were you at all concerned about uh, kind of walking a certain political line, knowing that even talking about certain sites uh, serves to identify you politically in some way? Thank you. Yes, yes. Uh, I was concerned about, you know, with that. Because, uh, you know, like I wanted um, to, to have uh, different perspectives uh, present 
Um, I mean, um, and uh, I, I don't believe in uh, neutrality on this. I mean, you know, and for example, I, I didn't mention while I was talking, but uh, you know, the, the texts were important to me and I asked a historian to write them. I, I, you know, over time I edited a little bit or here and there, but I actually asked a historian to write because I, I thought I, I was not able to write it. And, uh, and I wanted to have this like as, as much as possible neutral tone. Uh, but I, you know, it's, it's not really possible to be totally neutral, even with historians. I mean, those who know the scene in, in Croatia, I mean, you know, you have historians who, you know, interpret things in, you know, different politically, I mean, in different ways. So, so, uh, so it's very hard not to have interpretation of something. So as much as I could, I wanted this, uh, this text to be neutral. Uh, although I'm, I'm aware that you can read also my political statement in, in, in a way. But for example, I notice when I talk to people, uh, about events and, and those who are more on the left are quite uncomfortable talking about Bleiburg. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and I think it must be, I mean, for me, when I, sometimes I exhibit the whole series, but sometimes I exhibit only parts of it within some group exhibition and so, but I always are very careful with the selection of images because the images that the selection of images uh, can totally, you know, twist the context. So I always try to balance the, the those few images that I exhibit. If it's only five, then you know it has to be a Senovac in Bleiburg. It cannot only be a Senovac, you know. Uh, and also, it have to be. It has to be uh, uh, places of of where no, you know, with victims with no right to be remembered, because that's very important point of the of the project. Also, so I try to be. Uh, as open or you know raise questions and I'm with this project I, I didn't try to you know make a conclusion I wanted to open discussion I wanted to make people think and you know decide for themselves I mean I'm not I'm trying to to just open space for for thinking about the events and how we see events in the past how we how we remember things just open you know because people might not be aware of, of this. I mean, uh, so, so that was my goal. Uh, so I tried my best to be, to be open uh, and not uh, impose my thoughts or my uh, conclusions in this. So I don't know if this answers <laughs> your question. Exactly, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. And I would like just to mention, I mean, uh, if you can maybe send me a link that where I can read a bit more about blue blood butterflies, I think it's super interesting and I would like to, to know more. So if you can share maybe information where I can find it, that would be great. Otherwise, I would just okay, try to no find problem. it myself. No problem. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Are there any more questions, Tena? Yes, hello. Thank you very much for this fascinating presentation, which has certainly got us thinking. Um, so aside from the fact that my sister also walks her dog in Dotrshina, so you're probably uh, fellow dog walkers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and indeed, I mean, those um, um, those monuments, they are super fascinating. So it was uh, interesting to, to hear your, your take on them. Um, so uh, it got me thinking that um, um, uh, much the same process, I think, of uh, of being sort of frozen into models, if you want, of remembering, um, is also present in my experience of growing up as a high school student in Trieste. So not, mm -hmm. you know, Croatia, but, but in Italy. So in, in the autumn every year in Trieste, you would have two commemorations. One is the Riziera di San Saba, which is uh, the only concentration camp in Italy um, for Jewish people. Um, and the other one is the Foiba di Bazovica, which is the main Foiba where uh, the communist reprisal uh, after you know, they, they liberated Trieste led to um, also mass atrocities committed against uh, the fascists. So usually you would have uh, both uh, politicians, but I would also say 
student leaders, because I, I remember, you know, being a student then, and that the, uh, I mean, the, the, the the discourse, the narrative was also very much something that interested us as, uh, as citizens as, and as, you know, engaged citizens and students growing up. And it was super rare that somebody would go to both commemorations. Um, you would either go to one or the other and it would be a statement. And every year in and out, we would have this conversation. I mean, this uh, uh, completely blind, you know, discussion of um, of two models just uh, and two um, yeah blind positions uh, fighting each other so you know it, it really resonates with what your 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 research on uh, on Croatia is and it makes me thinking you know how how these instances also we lost Tina Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> I'm going to say this. Sorry, you lost me from my computer. Um, yeah, I mean, no, no thanks. Uh, basically, my question is um, how to make us unstuck in time, you know, how to try to uh, unfreeze us. And uh, yeah, if you can compare it to other model models of remembering. So if there are other models, either in Croatia or somewhere else, because you know my so my experience in in, in Italy, this is a small pocket of Italy, actually is very similar to what what you found. So are there any other models that could lead us to um, uh, finding a way to yeah to, to basically uh, move the process to to make it unstuck? Thank you. Yes, it would. Yes, you know, the, the working on this series was uh, you know my small attempt of contribution to being unstuck, you know, because I think, you know, we have, you know, uh, we have to, you know, move on by acknowledging what happened, you know, like there is no uh, use in debate about how many people were killed, you know, was it 100,000, was it a million, I mean, what, what difference does it make, I mean, it's a crime, I mean, we have to acknowledge both, you know, both sides of the story and and move on. I mean, from this, I'm, what we, we're stuck in the same discussion for more than 50 years. I mean, for example, I don't want my children to have the same topic. Like, you know, we have to move on. And and uh, so this, as, as I mentioned, this was a small attempt to, to you know, open, open space for different, uh, you know, for different uh, memory culture. And I also did, as Vita showed my also book, uh, war of images, and that was not that was my research actually that I did on war photography and uh, and uh, media representation of the war, and most of it is based on research on on Croatian and Serbian media in the nineties, and uh, and also you know um, later I did also an exhibition as a, I curated an exhibition based on this research that. Uh, that represented war in former Yugoslavia, but included all the sides. Because usually we are um, only remembering from our own perspective. So in Croatia, you would have the uh, only Croatian photographers or you know only Croatian perspective on the events. Then in, in Bosnia, you would have you know only Bosnian photographers. In Serbia, you would have only Serbian photographers and events. And I tried to put this together. And just, just you know, it's very interesting to see. I mean, you had photographers who were you know, photographing on different warring sides. And you know, now to have these images together gives you another perspective. Give you gives you another insight. So that was also an uh, an attempt for a different uh, discussion, you know, not inclusive discussion, not uh, national, just national discussion or national way of remembering things, you know, only creation perspective, you know, only separate perspectives on, on the events. I mean, we have still history that is uh, taught differently uh, in, in different schools, you know, in, in creation, creation students learn different things than Serbian uh, students in Croatia, I mean, uh, so it's, uh, it's very complicated. And, uh, and I know there are also initiatives of the history teachers uh, to, uh, to talk differently about these event, th those events. So I think those are all attempts to, to have a different discussion, to have a different uh, memory culture. And uh, I'm aware of the, this problem with Italy because I didn't show it here, but also I had two photographs from Foibas in Istria, 
in this in this project. So I know it's very similar uh, discussion going on. And when I also exhibited this work in, in Latvia, in Riga, uh, you know, I, I was worried how this is going to be perceived because it's quite local in, in the context, but they could relate also because they had also, you know, uh, the topics they don't talk about, for example, like Holocaust, but they liked more to, to be talked about uh, as, as Latvians, so as victims of, uh, of Soviet Union, you know, so they only talk about this, but they forget about the Holocaust, that's like pushed away from the memory. And then so they could relate also to, to, to this. Uh, so, so I think, you know, many countries have uh, the same problems with discussing history and, uh, you know, trying to in include more and not just uh, leave out perspectives and, and uh, focus on one dominant. So I don't know, I mean, there are organizations, for example, I worked with Documenta uh, Center, for, you, know, you know, in Croatia, that's very NGO that's very important with what they do and they are very uh, publicly active. So they comment and, and work and they have workshops with, uh, I, I was uh, part of the workshop uh, that was done with, uh, people from the from Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia, Germany, Italy, different countries uh, on memory culture. So everybody could share some of the stories and visited places of uh, historical play of historical importance and discuss, you know, why certain places are neglected, how we see those places. So it was all, I think it should be, you know, as much as possible discussed and talked and, uh, and uh, hopefully that will bring us uh, to solution and to a, a potential of being unstuck from this <laughs> historical narrative that we just repeat, repeat and uh, never resolve. Thank you very much. I think Katarina has a question. Um, hi, uh, first of all, thank you. This was super fascinating. And um, yeah, I loved the, I mean, yeah, I guess it's weird to love the photos that come from such <laughs> context, but they are lovely photos. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, the whole time I was thinking, uh, there is now such a super well established kind of memory studies, academic memory studies. And I think in the kind of policy NGO, it's also memorialization has really come to fore. But I think with these images, you really show the importance of other approaches, like art approaches that I think capture something that cannot be captured, like no matter how much we write as academics, you can't capture some of these things. And I was really taken by the idea to to look at landscapes rather than monuments as repositories of memory. And I mean, your photo of Ovchara, it really speaks to Ovchara. Like even before, like I was on your website, just scrolling through the images, even before like reading anything, I was like, oh, this mm -hmm. is so like, this is Slavonia and Baranya. This is like, mm -hmm. it just like speaks to, yeah, yeah it, it really recognizes. And I think what, what is powerful about it is that I am automatically associated with like normal life and home, right? Because then, because there is no monument, it stops being something exceptional and a war crime and you move it into the realm of, oh, this is just reminds me of like my family and my home. And I think that's the, that's the a super powerful, I guess, artistic tool that I think we cannot accomplish um, in other uh, mediums. Uh, and then it also reminded me uh, of Milica Tomic's work in Graz. I don't know if you know the, who works on these kind of also on soils and excavations and it really because I'm interested in this kind of landscape and soils and earth. Mm -hmm. um, so it really spoke to this as well. And I wanted to ask you maybe, maybe it's a bit unfair because it goes into your other work, but I know that you also in your curatorial work, you kind of curated exhibitions that focus more on personal, like on people and on images of really personal suffering. And I'm always interested in kind of how do artists navigate the ethics of this capturing very personal suffering? Because I think in academia, we are having a similar discussion now about the ethics of using personal suffering, basically for us as data, for I guess for artists as material, Mm -hmm. and whether you could say something about that or even compare it to, to to this other approach of using landscapes and working with landscapes or other or, or other but thank you so much uh, for coming and for your work it was really yeah really fascinating and a lot to think about thank you for all the remarks and uh, it's always super interesting to see how you i mean how you see and perceive certain things and you know what impression you get from it so um but yes ethics is super important when you deal with uh with subjects like like this and it's uh 
I, I don't know if you were referring to my series Beloved, maybe? No, I was referring to what you curated at the War, War Photography Museum in Zagreb. Ah, in Zagreb, yes, the, okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, I mean, I consider ethics, uh, you know, when I, while I was wor uh, writing the book, uh, War of Images, I wrote about also ethics, uh, you know, of war photography. That's, that's, I mean, the very important topic within, within, that, within this. Uh, so, of course, I'm trying to uh, be as ethical, I mean, as possible working as an artist or even, you know, a curator or a researcher. I mean, it's, uh, and I think this is a very important topic within science also. I mean, uh, uh, so yes, so we don't treat people as material or the suffering as just mater research material or artistic material. I mean, uh, we have to be considering. And of course, sometimes you, I questioned many times while I was working on this uh, book war of images and researching war photography, I, I questioned uh, my right to, to deal with the subject because I didn't live to the war. I mean, I, I originally am from Pula in, in Istria, which was not affected very much by the war. And I was at the time, I was studying photography in Prague. So I was, I mean, not part of it. Of course, I was following what's going on. I was coming home, but my family was not in danger so you know I didn't have this perspective and so I was very shy sometimes about you know do I have the right I mean you know because people also have sometimes this attitude I mean you know like I lived for this I mean this is I have the right to talk I mean and not you or you know you have these questions where were you in the 1991 that was very I mean uh, disturbing question and in the museum it was turned in a in a positive so it was interesting twist not I was not author of this, but the company that worked with the design, but it, it was interesting. And, uh, and uh, then I, I realized, I mean, it's sometimes very good to have a different perspective because I didn't have the emotions that usually people have who live through the war and they cannot separate, you know, of course, sometimes, yes, but it's hard to separate from something you know that lived you lived through it so emotionally so so for me it was a, a, i think a good perspective you know a, a person who understands the con context very well but still has a distance to to the events so so i thought it was a good combination in a way so i i, I mean i pursued my work and uh, but i i was i mean sometimes shy or felt a bit intimidated but lack of experience First hand of war, but uh, I mean, if you saw this exhibition in the museum in, in Zagreb, I mean, I tried, uh, I tried uh, uh, to put dif different perspectives together in the, in this exhibition, and I, I I didn't, I don't think I quite succeeded, you know. I I, I hope, I hope, I hope, I mean, I wish I I did better job because I at the end I I felt I didn't. Uh, take it far enough you know but that's another story maybe <laughs> I don't know if I answered the question but yes ethics is very important and I'm trying to and probably sometimes fail in doing the right thing are there any other questions maybe no, I, I still have this question, which is like very, very important to me, but maybe it, it, it's not for you. So I'm just posing it and and um, looking for some answers here, maybe for my own research. What is very clear, I think, in your work is that you're dealing with um, rural areas. So it's it's all the, the landscapes, you know, and, and you're actually talked about them being remote and because of them being remote, them being perfect sites, I think you said, for for those um those those um yeah mess mess executions and, and and horrible things that took place there. But I don't know, I just yesterday I, I read um Benjamin again on and his uh, little little history on photography and what he says met, makes a lot of sense too when he says that actually um, the, the city should be treated as a crime scene in photography because it is a crime scene and every, every um, bypasser is, is, you know, a potential um, 
a part of, of it. And, and it just made really sense for me again to think about this, um, how, of course, such a project wouldn't be possible in a city because there are all these layers and, and it would just be, or maybe it would be, I don't know, this is kind of my question, maybe, you know, did you think about it being rural places before going there or did they just happen to be all somewhere out there? Uh, this happened to be, yes, somewhere out there, but I also fo focused on, on, uh, on landscape. Uh, but, you know, how you mentioned that, it's interesting that you mentioned that, you know, all the city, you know, streets should be treated as uh, crime scenes. I, I, when I was working on this project, I was not able to see nature uh, apart from this project. I was just seeing the nature as a place for mass crime. I, would, I was not able to walk in Maximir without looking at everywhere, like uh, looking everywhere for si signs of, you know, crime, because after a while I was able to recognize, you know, how the landscape would look like if that would be a good place for a mass, you know, mass crime to be hidden. Or also, you know, when you walk in Zagreb and, and if you do a bit of research, then you find out that there are many locations in the city that... Uh, that are connected to the history, you know, I, I looked in uh, like Maximir, it's also the place of the park, but, uh, but also a uh, place where the student centrum, it was locations, location where Jews were gathered for transportation also. So there are, I mean, many locations in the city and, uh, and uh, it, many, many locations I didn't, I mean, I, ne I never thought of this project that it's finished because it's you know but also i did, my my plan was not to map or you know uh have all the locations because it's impossible you know i think the serious work uh works good in you know like uh you you, you understand the principle you, you understand what i'm talking about even if i'm not pointing to all the locations uh but it's it was you know terrible actually to 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 look and not be able to to walk in the city without thinking about this and uh, and i know about some other projects that that uh, that treats city i mean and and take pictures i mean people who photographed locations of uh, hate crimes for example in the city so i mean then it's that doesn't have this context of nature <coughs> sorry I will just just having a look around. If there are any last questions, maybe mm. now is, is a perfect time. Or have you were you finished, Sandra? Uh, yes, I, I hope so. I uh, I was a bit caught by coughing <laughs> at the end, but um, but I know about some projects, as I mentioned, that uh, treat the city in the same way mm -hmm. as a crime scene, as you mentioned. So it is possible, uh, but then it's not maybe about the nature. It's more located within human experience or, you know, the city and... Uh, Can I ask a question? Of course. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I, I, I would like to read your book about war images. I'm coming from Bosnia and Herzegovina, and now I'm in Poland doing my own research about intergenerational transmission of war memories in families in, in Bosnia. So I'm really interesting, uh, and uh, I would like to ask you about these, um, like, I, uh, which kind of theories are you using in your backgrounds? Is this like memory from memory studies or mm -hmm. can you explain me more? Yes, I mean, uh, if you on my, on my website, you can find one text that I wrote uh, about this project. And then uh, there I qu quote, for example, Pierre Nora. And, you know, so that, but that's like basic, uh, you know, it's very basic uh, memory studies. I mean, I'm not a, a scholar in this, so it's, uh, I'm almost a bit ashamed to, talk, you know, because people among you, there are people who are, you know, research, do, you know, important research about this. And I'm just, uh, you know, like uh, very superficial and basic. My knowledge is very basic in this, but, uh, 
but I uh, yes I read for example as I mentioned Liz Bell she was she was writing on photography but uh, she wrote on you know on landscape but also wrote about other artists that worked with this topic and then Pierre Nora of course and uh, uh, there is one book that was in, in interesting it was published in Croatia I don't remember the the, the title but there is a it's referenced in this text uh, that is like a collection of, to, of the texts that uh, deal with the memory culture. So I used some of it, uh, you know, but, but when I started working on this project, I didn't read any of the theory. Then, you know, later when I wanted to write something about it, then I read a little bit more about it. And, uh, but it was not based on theory that I read before. It was more based on my personal experience because also I, I, um, I lived in Pula. I went to study in Prague, and I came back after the war, and I moved to Zagreb, not to Pula. And and you know, uh, even how you see things, uh, living in Pula and living in Zagreb is quite different. I mean, and what I saw when I came back uh, in Zagreb was not you know, uh, what I remembered from before, it was, I, I saw lots of nationalism, I saw lots of things that I wanted to, you know, react, and it took me a long, long time to uh, be able to, uh, you know, work with these ideas or impressions that I got, but then I worked with it as an artist, as a researcher, as a curator, I tried to contribute a little bit with this discussion on, on, on war and how we, you know, talk after the war and how we um, have memories about the war. <coughs> <coughs> I'm, I'm sorry, it's again, I guess it's what I was talking about today. So. Uh, we made you talk a lot today, so <coughs> maybe that costs tributes now. Um, I think I'm since there are no questions, I have a lot, but I'm not going to take up more of your time now. And I think we just close up now, right? Having another look here in the round. So I would just like to thank you very much, Sandra, for having been here, for, for having shared your, your wonderful work with us and, and gave us all these great insights. I'm just having a look for the interested ones and the rest of us. Next week's um, seminar will be hosted by Katarina Kusic and we will hear about um, Yugoslav Women Plus Collective, which I think will be also very interesting and I'm very much looking forward to that. So again, thank you very much, Sandra. It's been a pleasure and I am really, really happy that you've been here with us. And Bye to everyone else. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just to say thank you one more time to you, as Rita, for thank inviting you. me and to everyone no, thank you, really. for listening, for uh, giving me your feedback and your thoughts and uh, your questions. It was really uh, valuable to me. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Thank you. Ciao. <clears throat>